Good morning. I'm Pastor Jerry Ladd. Thank you for joining us here at Grace Point Fellowship Baptist Church's Morning Worship Online. Hey, we're hoping and praying that this is going to be uh, one of our last times to have worship without a congregation. Uh, next Sunday morning, we hope and pray that you're going to be joining us here at Grace Point Fellowship at 11 a.m. for our one-hour service here at Grace Point Fellowship Church Plant. Please come and join us. This morning, I'm sharing with you from Exodus chapter 14. Would you get your Bibles and turn with me there? Exodus chapter 14. Did you know that if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, that you're going to go through trials, that you're going to go through difficulties? And did you also know that your current trial is a faith builder for your future? God set you up to let you go through difficulties and trials with His help and with His strength, and He does that to build your character, to build your faith for greater things in the future. Our scripture today is going to be from Exodus chapter 14, verses 30 and 31. But before we read that scripture, let's go back and do a recap. We've been looking at where the Israelites were and how they seemed to be trapped and how God just kept answering their prayers and bringing them through. So let's do a recap of what happened right before where we're going to focus on today. Join with me in Exodus chapter 14. We're going to read verses 21 through 29. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong wind all that night. And he made the sea into a dry land, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued them, and they went after them in the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Now it came to pass in the morning, watch, that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians. And he took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians on their chariots, and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained. But the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Don't you love this account from God's Word? What an exciting picture to see this miracle of God. What I love is that three different times God's Word says that they walked across on dry ground with walls of water on their left and on their right, on either side on dry ground, but with walls of water. Folks, this is an incredible and wonderful miracle. We can't explain it on a natural basis, although some people have. You either believe in God's miracles or you don't. Some people have tried to explain this away as being an allegory or just a flat-out fable. Or maybe they were saying that uh, God wanted to use this as a parable, as an illustration. Well, folks, I'm going to tell you, uh, you can't explain it away with that just like you can't explain it away with what some people thought was a misspelling in the Bible. They say, a lot of people try to say that, uh, that this miracle occurred because they didn't cross the Red Sea, but because they crossed the Reed Sea. Now, the Reed Sea is in a different location, but the Reed Sea was only about six inches deep of water filled with reeds and mud and different things. And somebody told me one time, they said, well, that would even have been just as great or a greater miracle that they had crossed the Reed Sea. You say, well, why is that? And they said, well, because all of those hundreds and thousands of Pharaoh's armies and soldiers and men drowned in six inches of water. Well, I'm going to tell you, when God's Word says that they crossed the Red Sea, what it really means is they crossed the Red Sea. You know, there are enough historical facts still around to prove that this occurred. The very name of the place 
where it occurred is one of the things that tell us. The name of the place where they crossed over is called Nueva. Now, the old and full name that it was kind of taken down to came from Nueva al Muzayana. Now, I hope I pronounced that correctly. But what it means is the waters of Moses opening or the waters that Moses opened. Did you know that not only can you tell by the name, but even recently in the last number of years, pillars were found on each side of where the exact crossing was, where the Bible describes that they went, and there was a pillar on Israel's side, and there was a pillar on the opposite side. Research into those pillars show that they were Solomon's pillars made by Solomon and put there to mark that Moses had crossed there under God's direction. Folks, the crossing site not only was there marked by those pillars, but also between those two pillars, there in the water is littered with chariot wheels, parts, and bones. I'm going to encourage you to go to a, uh, a website and watch some of the information there. It's called Wyatt Museum. And if you will go to www.wyattmuseum.com, you're going to see some documentaries there where a man, where Mr. Wyatt and his sons dove into the Red Sea and found parts of chariots down there between those two places. Now, why would there be chariots there? Folks, you know exactly why. You can also go to YouTube and watch the Red Sea Crossing. But I'm going to tell you, it's time for us to move on for this morning's message. So let's move forward. Did you know that these verses, once again, tell us that God saved Israel from Egypt? Read with me in Exodus chapter 14, verses 30 and 31. It says here, So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Would you pray with me? Father, we are so grateful for your word. Would you help us not to skim over these very few words, Lord, that mean so much to us, that the people gain so much by seeing your miracle. Help us, Father, not only to hear it, but to digest it to our very hearts today. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. These verses, again, said that God had saved Israel from Egypt. First of all, he delivered them by the blood of the Lamb from the death angel, and Pharaoh released them out of Egypt. And then, now, as we read, he delivered them from, from Egypt's army by the sea. Each time, God let them, let them get into a very difficult and dire situation before he miraculously delivered them. Now, this morning, the very emphasis of my message is why. Why did God allow them to get in such difficulties and wait until they were in such dire straits before he rescued them by miracle? Listen, I like the way that Robert Morgan said, Morgan said it in his book, The Red Sea Rules. He said that trials and troubles are treadmills for the soul. In other words, God allows us trials and difficulties to increase our faith. It is those trials and those hardships that make us stronger and stronger in the Lord. You know, we don't always know why God allows problems, but we do know that He intends to use those problems to deepen our faith and strengthen us in Him. In Exodus chapter 14, we note that it concludes how the Israelites had benefited from the miraculous and the narrow escape. How coming on those hardships and difficulties, literally getting to the place where they said, have you brought us out here to die and there's no way to escape? And then God let them out? The scripture says that they then, after God led them through on dry ground with walls of water on either side and then wiped out Pharaoh's army with the water, that they feared the Lord finally. They feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord, and they believed in his servant, Moses. Listen, this impossible difficulty between army and sea strengthened their faith. It strengthened their faith for what? For greater challenges that were going to be ahead of them. They had much to do and far to go before they ever reached 
what God had promised them in the land of Canaan. They were going to go through very, very much. And they needed this strength to know that God would carry them through. Here's the truth about faith that you need to remember. Did you know that faith has a cumulative quality to it? Faith is kind of like your retirement fund. It doesn't just appear at the end of your uh, working life. It's amassed over time. It's added to. It's grown. It's developed. Listen, that's the way our faith is. It is amassed over time. It's added to. It's grown just a little bit at a time. It is developed by God in you. We lay it in store for future times. That's what God was doing with Israel here at the Red Sea. So let's talk just a little bit about what is faith. First of all, we know that faith is a tangible response to a spiritual reality. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, God's Word tells us that faith is confidence in what we hope for. And it is an assurance about what we cannot yet see. Faith is is the connecting power to the spiritual realm. Faith is what links us to God. Faith leads us to obedience. And faith, dear friends, our faith pleases God. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. That is Hebrews chapter 11 verse Verse 6, let me relate to you some examples of faith. And I know that you probably remember most of these. In Acts chapter 27, Paul told some of his shipmates when he was being taken back to Rome and they got into a very fierce storm and they thought that that the ship was going to sink. He said, do not fear. God told me that he's going to save our lives and I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. And you know what? It happened. God saved their lives when they should not have been rescued from that storm. In Luke chapter 1, the scripture tells us that Mary went to visit her cousin Elizabeth right after she had been told that she was going to bear God's son. And she told Elizabeth what God had said, and she said, I believe that God is going to use me for this blessing. Elizabeth cried out, and she said, Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. Folks, that is a great definition of faith. Another one, in Romans chapter 4, it tells us that Abraham was strengthened in his faith and that he gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. And that, dear friend, is another example of faith. One that happened just a few years ago in Fort Worth, Texas in 1999. You may recall that a a lone gunman went into Wedgwood Baptist Church He stood inside that church building and confronted uh, members of faith. He told one young lady, 14 years old, her name was Cassie Griffin. He said, if you don't recant of your faith, I'm going to kill you. He said, recant of your faith or you'll die. She looked him right in the eyes and says, I can't do that. I cannot recant my faith. I believe in God. And that young man took her life. She boldly affirmed her faith and he took her life. That, dear friends is indeed yet another example of faith. Something that you might not have known about little Cassie is that she passionately collected frogs. She collected frogs of all kinds. Stuffed frogs, ceramic frogs, frog pictures, all kinds of frogs. And one thing you need to know is that it wasn't just about the frogs. It was about how frogs were spelled because she knew that every frog that she collected reminded her that she fully relied on God. F-R-O-G. That acronym fit her to a T because she fully relied on God. And dear friends, that again is a very apt definition of faith. What is faith? Faith is believing that what God said is going to be accomplished. Faith is being persuaded that God has the power to do exactly what He has promised to do. Believing that the things that He has just told us are going to occur. That's what it means to fully rely on God. Maybe we too need to be frogs. Maybe we need to collect frogs to remind us that we are not only supposed to fully rely on God, but that we need to fully rely on God. Believing that the things that God promised are going to occur. Folks, that 
is faith. For Christians, faith is making reasonable assumptions about God's care and His control over our life based on what? Based on His promises. Based on His Word. As a Christian, we're expected to have faith. Isn't that exactly what it means to be a believer? If we're a believer, what do we believe in? That God exists? Listen, God's Word tells us that even the devil believes that God exists. And yet, he's not a, a believer that's going to go to heaven. There's a difference there. What does it mean then to be a believer? That we put our full faith and trust in God. That we believe that what he says is true. And that we believe that he uh, will redeem us through his son. And that he's preparing a place for us in heaven. Folks, I'm going to tell you, we disappoint God when we question his ability. But we please God when we truly believe. In Mark chapter 4, verses 39 and 40, you may recall that Jesus stood and he calmed the winds and the waves in that tiny boat that he and the disciples were in. Peace be still, he said, and all the waters calmed down. Then he turned around and looked at the disciples who had been so afraid and said, are you just going to let us die? And he said, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Like what Warren Wiersbe said, he said this, a faith that cannot be tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. Has your faith been tested? And if it's been tested, are you allowing it to bring you through? Here's another truth about faith. Faith is quantifiable. It's quantifiable. It can be measured. Now, we know this because Jesus knew uh, that, that faith came in different quantities. And he was intently interested in the quantity of faith that people had that were around him and that he encountered. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 26, he told the disciples, Why are you fearful? We just read that, O ye of little faith. So it was quantified in a small measure. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 10, he told a man, I have not found such great a faith in all of Israel. So this man had great faith because he's, he said, I trust you, Jesus, that whatever you say is going to be accomplished. There are degrees of faith, and Jesus Christ rewards those who trust him in faith. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 2, when he saw the faith of the friends who brought the paralytic before him and dropped him, him down through the roof and put him in front of Jesus Christ because they couldn't get to him from the doors, he told that man, when he saw the faith of who? His friends. He said, son, be of good cheer, for your fears are forgiven. And he not only forgave his sins, which was the greater thing, but he healed his body too. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 28, he told a woman, great is your faith. Let it be done to you as you so desire. She wanted a healing and just needed a touch. And she knew that that would do it. And Jesus said, great is your faith. According to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 that we read just a few moments ago, God wants to bless every believer's faith. Hebrews 11, verse 6 tells us, without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. An old friend and college professor and pastor of First Baptist Church of Houston, John Bassanio, uh, told this story about himself. He said that he was sitting in his living room reading a book and uh, that his little five-year-old daughter came to him and she said, Daddy, will you build me a dollhouse? And he was half listening, so he said, yes. Well, uh, a few minutes later as he was reading, he saw that she had gone out the back door and he looked out the back window and saw that she was hauling dishes and dolls and, and doll clothing and all kinds of doll furniture and hauling them out in the backyard. And he asked his wife, he says, what is she doing? And she says, oh, you promised to build her a dollhouse, and she believed you. She's out there getting ready. John Bassanio said, I threw that book aside, and I raced to the lumber yard. I bought everything that was needed, and I built her a dollhouse. Why? Because of her childlike faith in a daddy's promise. Don't you know that God's Word tells us that our Father is the good, good Father. That if we as human parents know how to want to give good gifts, how to and want to give good gifts, how much more the Heavenly Father wants to do so. He wants to give us good gifts.
One old theologian put it this way. He said, the faith and trust that we put in God honors Him much. And it draws down great graces. When God finds a soul penetrated with a living faith, He pours into it His graces and favors plentifully. Folks, if you're stranded at your own Red Sea, I'm going to ask you, would you trust God? Would you trust the promises of God that are found in His Word? The Lord loves you, and the Lord loves to respond to your faith. He loves to reward your faith. He wants to. Even His own Word says that He is a rewarder of faith and those who seek Him. So how do we build our faith then? You know, God's Word tells us that it's quantifiable, and you may recall in God's Word that said, if you have but a the faith the side of what? Size of a mustard seed. He said that you can say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and cast into the sea, and it'll be done. Folks, even with a little faith. So how do we increase our faith? How do we make our faith to grow? God increases our faith. Lord, I believe. That's how it starts. We go to God and we pray, Lord, help my unbelief. Lord, increase my faith. I not only believe, but I want to believe more. I have prayed those prayers in my life. I've shared uh, a number of times with you, different times, that God moved my heart, that my faith was just a little wobbly. And he reminded me that if I was going to receive anything from him, that it was going to have to be when I had full faith. And I prayed and said, God, help my unbelief. And miraculously, God works. We know that faith is not something that we can muster up at our own will. Faith has got to be given by God and it's got to be developed according to His process. Faith has got to be grown. It doesn't just happen. Did you know that God intends us to grow spiritually? And so our faith needs to grow. But how does that happen? Like any good teacher, God bestows truth to us and then He devises a test to review that truth and reinforce that truth. Now, how does God teach us truth? Folks, it's right here in His Word. If you want to know the truth of God, you've got to read God's Word. You can't just sleep close to it. You can't just stay around it. Folks, you've got to get into it. First, like the teacher, it says that He teaches us His Word. He bestows truth. This is truth. Jesus is truth. His Word is truth. And then He devises that test to review and reinforce His truth. In other words, to transfer and translate it into an everlasting, life-changing experience. And like any good coach, he sits down with his players and he uses the game book, God's Word, the Bible, and he explains his rules. He reviews the plays. He, he lets almost every situation that could possibly happen in our life show up in his Word. And if it's not exactly the same, at least the principles are the same. The ethics are the same. And after he explains the rules from the game book and reviews the plays, then comes the scrimmage. What's the scrimmage? Daily life. You get up in the morning into a scrimmage each and every day, if you will. And at the end of each scrimmage, each day, we have the game reviews, and that's called our quiet time and our prayer time, where we stop and we reflect on the day, talk to God about what things have gone on and how we need to give them to Him. And we look at the playbook yet again, we learn more to apply the next day. Folks, it's a daily cycle until good players become great players, until good disciples become great disciples. New Christians become growing disciples. With God's leadership and strength, our little bit of faith grows into great faith. That's how God works with us, and that's how God worked with the children of Israel. He gave instruction through Moses, and then he brought them to the Red Sea. So in essence, he was saying, here's your test. Have you listened to me? I've delivered you out of Egypt to this point. Are you going to trust me? What are you going to do? Will you apply my promises to your problem? Of course, they didn't do it. But Moses showed them what God could do and what God was going to do. Not only did it happen right there, but even later in the desert with no food or water, they had to trust God. And God delivered them food. God delivered them water. God did not let their clothes or their shoes wear out. God provided all they needed. And then, of course, you recall that later with the disciples, he did the exact same thing. 
He took them through the terrible storms. He led them where 5,000 men and their families were saying, we're hungry. How are you going to feed us? And they had nothing to feed them with. God showed them how he could take a little and feed every person. They learned, as we must learn, that as we trust God with every trust and with every victory, we are strengthened for our future. The principle is this. Our faith grows when we choose to apply God's promises to today's problems and then when we use the experiences to mature us for tomorrow's challenges. That's why the Bible is so full of God's promises. God provides a very special promise to us to bear us through every need that we have, through every circumstance that we'll come across. That's why we need to read and know God's Word. That's why we need to need to know the Scriptures. There's no condition that you can be put in. There's no condition that I can be put in, but that you have a promise from God that you can claim to overcome the problem, that you can apply to the difficulty, and that God will take you through. But you cannot claim a promise if you don't know it. Your faith needs a promise to live in. Your faith needs a promise to live in. Somebody said years ago that faith lives in a promise like a fish lives in water. So if you want your faith to live, you keep it bathed. You keep it swimming in the promises of God. You keep it heavy into God's word. God's promises are our basis for all of life and all of faith. They are the way to strengthen our faith. And the way to strengthen is to focus on the promises of God. Strength comes when we know God's particular spoken word for our particular condition or our current condition or need. If you know God's word, you can say, hey, God's word says this about that. But folks, if you don't know God's word, how are you going to apply it? Faith is being in any situation and every situation and claiming the promise of God for that particular situation and then being fully persuaded that God has the power to do what he's promised to do, which is to carry you through, to get you through the difficulty. He never said he would take us around it. He never said that he would remove it. He said that he would get us through Sometimes that means we're going to live a long life here for the Lord. And sometimes that means that God may take us home early to keep us from the trouble that is ahead. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Folks, your faith will not grow unless you exercise it. And you'd better do so. Why? Because you're training for the days that are to come. God has you in training for greater things. Will you trust the Lord and in faith? Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we have your word. We are so thankful that we have the promises. We're so thankful that we have the playbook. And that we have the strength of your Holy Spirit. Not just to know them, but Father, to apply them to our life. God, would you help us with that? That as we learn your word and as we hold them to our hearts, as we meditate on them, Lord, that you would bring them to thought in mind with every difficulty that we had, that we may apply your truth, your principles to every trial, that our faith might grow and that we might have victory in the Lord our God. Father, would you help us? And we pray for these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Folks, do you realize that you can't call on God for extra faith if you've never met Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? I pray that today would be that day. Call on Him in faith. Did you know that God's Word says that whoever calls upon Him with belief from their heart, believing that He is God's Son, that He rose from the dead, that person can be saved. Would you call on Him even now? And dear friends, if your faith is wavering even as a believer, God wants you to return to Him in grace and in strength. It is our hope and our prayer that you will do that. And it is also our hope and prayer that you will do that with us. If you don't have a home church, come be with us. 
We'd love to have you to be a part of Grace Point Fellowship. Would you join us? We are going to be returning to public worship next Sunday morning. We are so excited to have this date set up to return to worship services together. Next Sunday morning at 11 a.m., we'll gather here. We're going to have a brief service because we're going to be doing the best we can to observe the social distancing practices that our government has set up for us. Listen, we want to honor God, and so we're joining together, but we also want to be obedient to our, uh, our government and those who are over us, so we're going to be doing our best to protect others around us. Now, as you know, and as I know, there is a lot of concern and a lot of controversy about churches getting back together and whether there is a need for this or a need for that. Well, let me just tell you right out, our church's position on the COVID-19 protocol, first and foremost, you know, it really doesn't matter what we think. What matters is what we do. And I know this, every member, every person is precious to us and they are worth guarding. We believe that it's better to be safe than sorry. So although we're going to be meeting together, we're going to do our best to practice the social distancing protocol. Bring your mask and wear it from your car into the service. Once you get into your seat where we're already uh, set up for social distancing, you can take that mask off. You don't have to wear it all day, but we encourage you to wear it from the car inside and then from inside back out to your car. We want you to join with us. We'll, we will indeed be disinfecting between every service. So uh, we pray that you'll join us. Don't hesitate. I'm going to remind you of this. Although we're all in the same storm, this COVID thing, this pandemic, this quarantine thing together, although we're all in the same storm, remember people, we're not all in the same boat. Some people are much more vulnerable to this than we are. They are at much higher risk than others. That's the folks that we need to particularly be careful with and take care of. We, as God's church and as God's people, will do all we can to guard and protect every person that we can. Regardless of your opinion of the threat, we're going to ask you, would you do with us, do that with us as well? And I'm going to ask that if you would, please be considerate of others. Of all the people to protect and be considerate of others, the church, God's people, should be doing it foremost of all. So do this. If you're ill in any manner, please wait. Don't come to church. If you're ill, don't even think about coming. Stay home. We are going to continue this broadcast on Sunday mornings. It'll be a little different. You'll see some of the people here, and it'll be from a little further back. But folks, we're going to be presenting the gospel, so you'll get the message, and you'll hear the music. But if you're ill, please stay home. Don't even think about it. You do not want to put somebody else, and especially a large congregation, at risk. Adhering to the protocols that we've set up is a great way to show your love and your care for others. As risk decreases, we look forward to loosening those guidelines. We're looking forward to the hugging and the fellowship and all that God gives us to do. But until then, we're going to be safe. Would you join us? The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace.